Hi, this is the overview video for chapter 12, Sources of Magnetic Fields. This is a long chapter that covers quite a few difficult topics. So I want you to make sure that you slow down, take enough time in this chapter, uh, read through the sections, and make use of the lecture resources that are available. In section 12.1, the Biot-Savart law is where you are introduced to the elementary source of magnetic field, current. Biot-Savart law is presented in this form. I want you to take a look at it and notice the similarity between the Biot-Savart law and Coulomb's law for electricity. And there are key differences too. In Coulomb's law, for example, the form that we introduced first was for point charge. In applying Biot-Savart law, we have to come to the realization with the fact that current flows in over a path and there's no such a thing as a point current. So in applying Biot-Savart law, you always have to do on some kind of integration. So um, in the other lecture, I will uh, go deeper into that, both the comparison with the Coulomb's law and the introduction to applications of Biot-Savart law. So in your textbook, the next three sections will be application of Biot-Savart law. Uh, there are a few examples here. Um, for example, magnetic field due to a current segment. And in section 12.2 is when the textbook drives a magnetic field due to a long current carrying wire. I want you to take a note of the result that they drive because they're going to drive this using different method one more time. This is set up for the magnetic field due to an infinitely long line of current is a good setup both for application of a Biot-Savart law. It's a, a challenging integral, but not so challenging that it can't be done. And for application of Bachuelsi starting in section 12.5, Ampere's law. This uh, configuration has enough uh, symmetries that you can exploit that symmetry to simplify the calculation quite a bit. And that's what you will see in section 12.5. In this section is also where the textbook illustrates the second right-hand rule. I think the textbook uh, talked about the second form of the right-hand rule earlier, and this is another place where you can see it. Um, it's uh, again using the right hand <laughs> and before we use the right hand rule to figure out the direction of the cross product by orienting the fingers in the direction of the first vector and then orient the hand so that you can curl the fingers in the direction of the second vector that is the first right hand rule and the fundamental right hand rule what it's showing here is a shortcut that shows the relationship between the direction of current and the magnetic field that is produced by the current. Um, so what this figure is showing is you take your right hand, you orient the hand with the thumb out so that the thumb points in the direction of the current. Then uh, the direction that your fingers curl in is the direction in which magnetic fields are going in circles around the wire. So you can imagine if you have a current that's coming towards you, or I guess coming towards you, then what direction does the magnetic field appear? If you look at my fingers, how they curl, they curl in the counterclockwise direction. So that's uh, what you will see. That's what this uh, second form of right hand rule quickly shows that uh, given the direction of current, what direction do magnetic fields go in? You can verify that these directions are correct by using the first form of the right hand rule and the cross product that you have seen with the Biot-Savart law. The next section, section 12.3, is an, it's an interesting section that ties together what we covered in chapter 11, magnetic force on current carrying wire, and what we are covering now in chapter 12, the magnetic fields produced by current carrying wire. So this section goes through this example of two parallel currents to calculate the force between them. And I guess the thing I want to point out is that this uh, particular setup is of interest because this is the setup used to, to define the unit of ampere current, uh, coulombs per second, in the SI unit system. 
this is the interesting thing about electric units in SI system, it's that Coulomb, the unit of charge, it's not the basic SI unit. It's a derived unit. It's derived by ampere, which is defined based on this setup here. The amount of force per length is defined to be exactly this, meaning uh, infinite significant figures. And using that force, ampere is defined, and using ampere and the definition of second from other sources, ampere times second gives you Coulomb. So, so it's a, a particularly interesting setup for that reason. This uh, setup shows how the SI unit system defines its uh, electric unit. And um, I guess even without that unit uh, trivia, it's uh, still an interesting application of magnetic force and magnetic field as can be calculated using Pierce-Savart's law. The next section, section 12.4, is the last section using Biot-Savart's law for magnetic field calculation, uh, magnetic field of a current loop. And this is probably the most common way in which we model a magnetic field producing setup. In fact, one of the setups that you will see in lab um, called Helmholtz coils is a combination of two coils separated by distance r, the radius of each coil. And that setup is designed with a particular purpose in mind, and it's very convenient for many experimental arrangements. Uh, read through the section carefully. Look at the derivation of the magnetic field. This is the expression for the magnetic field along the axis of the loop. Um, it turns out if you're trying to calculate the magnetic field anywhere but the axis, it gets a little bit complicated. So we won't do it and I won't ask you for it. Uh, when we are discussing magnetic field due to a current loop, we will always talk about it along the axis only. So one of the reasons the current loop is such a useful model is what you get out of the current loop. When you go through all the calculation of magnetic field, it turns out that the field generated by current loop looks very similar to the field that you see from electric dipole. In fact, this is a model of magnetic dipole. And there being no magnetic monopole, magnetic dipole is the most elementary unit, elementary object that can be producing magnetic field. And there's a lot of analogy you can draw between this magnetic dipole, field of magnetic dipole, torque on the magnetic dipole, uh, force on the magnetic dipole, and the, all the same quantities with the electric dipole. The field of electric dipole, the torque on the electric dipole, the force on the electric dipole. Uh, there are some places where you do have to watch out for differences, but uh, because of the great similarity and analogy, the magnetic dipole is a very useful magnetic object to be familiar with. Finally, as we look ahead to Ampere's law in section 12.5, there's a reason this had to be covered before Ampere's law. So what you will see in sections 12.5 and 6 with Ampere's law is that we will be able to greatly simplify calculations by exploiting symmetry. The current loop is the setup where there isn't as much symmetry as we would like. So we can't use Ampere's law to calculate the magnetic field here. That's why we have to use Biot-Savart's law and the direct integration that you see here. So with that, let's get into Ampere's law. As you learn about Ampere's law, I hope you begin to see some similarity between Ampere's law and Gauss's law. There's uh, some similarity in the mathematical form. Ampere's law involves an integral. Gauss's law did also. And Ampere's law involves a current enclosed within some geometric object. The same way in Gauss's law, you talk about charge enclosed within other geometric object. There are key differences. In Ampere's law, this integral here, it's a line integral, it's a one-dimensional integral. And we talk about Amperian path or Amperian loop. It's a one-dimensional object. In Gauss's law, 
the integral here was a surface integral and the object we considered were Gaussian surfaces, a two-dimensional object. So with those differences in mind, in terms of applying Ampere's law to finding magnetic field, there's a lot that's similar to application of Gauss's law to finding electric field. You exploit symmetry in the setup, and it's only in the setups with a high degree of symmetry that you can use either Ampere's law or Gauss's law to find the magnetic field or the electric field. So one such situation is the magnetic field due to a wire. It has a high degree of cylindrical and translational symmetry. So Ampere's law is used to find the magnetic field and when you go through the calculation, you find the result that's the same as what we found with the bio savart law, which is, I hope, comforting. Um, and take a look at the other lecture videos for the introduction of Ampere's law and application of Ampere's law with the four geometries in which it can be applied. Your textbook covers one. It covered the cylindrical geometry with the examples 12.6 and 12.7 and it will cover the geometry of solenoid and toroids. And in the available lectures, you will find the application of Ampere's law to a planar geometry. So in section 12.6, solenoids and toroids, these are uh, new geometries. You haven't seen this with uh, electricity. These uh, come into play with the magnetism. Take a look, both are both uh, theoretically and experimentally important geometries. And uh, there's a, one thing that your textbook does in derivation of magnetic field due to solenoid that I do slightly differently, which is in your textbook, I think they simply state that the magnetic field is zero outside the solenoid and they don't prove that statement. You will see in my lecture that uh, this can actually be proved using Ampere's law itself. So. Uh, take a look at the lecture for that. And this solenoid is used in experimental setups when we need highly uniform magnetic field because it produces very uniform magnetic field, almost like uh, how a parallel plates pl produce uniform electric field, but you know with a different geometric character. The toroid is the second new geometry. It looks like a donut, and when we talk about toroid, we are talking about a setup where wire has been wrapped around something that looks like a donut. And uh, uh, this is a useful geometry for both for calculation of magnetic field because it's a, one of the only four geometries where Ampere's law can be used to, to calculate the magnetic field. And uh, this is, turns out to be a useful shape for creating uh, electric circuit devices like uh, inductor that you will see in a couple of weeks. It uh, consists of a wire wrapped around a ferrite toroid. So, uh, so take a look at that and also take a look at the, the lecture videos on that. Um, I guess in my calculations I assume that the cross section of toroid is rectangular instead of circular that you see here. Um, both of the derivations that you see in the textbook and in the lecture they are both valid for whatever shape of the cross section. If you look at the derivation carefully, you will see that the derivation doesn't make any assumption about the shape of the cross section of toroid. So the final section is section 12.7, magnetism in matter. And in the practical terms, this is probably the most uh, practically important uh, section. Um, and uh, I still need to cover this in lecture. I don't have a lecture for that yet, I will do my best to cover. In the meantime, I'll try to briefly say why it's so important. It has to do with when you use uh, magnetism practically. Say you are creating an electromagnet, a uh, magnet whose strength you can control with uh, uh, electricity, electric current. It, electromagnets often look like a solenoid, these uh, coils of wires. But if you are making this for the magnetic field, you don't have an empty core. You use a ferrite or iron core. That core allows you to pro produce a much larger magnetic field you would be able to using a given amount of current. 
so understanding why certain materials that exhibit ferromagnetism, why it enhances the magnetic field, it's good to know. Maybe if not, why at least that, that, that they do enhance the magnetic field. And the details about the paramagnetism and diamagnetism, it's useful in understanding some chemical reactions, I'm told. Um, so you do have a conceptual question on this material, so take a look at it and do your best. And I guess I will leave you here for this video, which is that there is a great deal of analogy, comparison that can be made between magnetism in matter and electricity in matter. So the kind of modifications you have to make to the magnetism formulas and the considerations, derivations leading up to it, when you examine it for magnetism, it's very similar for electricity. That's why we made sure to cover dielectrics when we did the capacitors. So I would invite you to compare these formulas on your own. Take a look at the formulas for magnetic field in matter and, and look at the, for example, formulas for capacitance when a capacitor has a dielectric in its uh, original air gap. So with that, I will leave you to read the rest of the section and try to come back to this for a separate lecture later. So until next time, bye.